Warning, this podcast orders its profanity by the fuck ton. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey and by Vulgarity for Charity, the fundraiser where you provide the charity, we provide the vulgarity. Stay tuned for details. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Revan here, just reminding everyone that we have an important election coming up in November. Here in Kentucky, we have a great candidate for Senate by the name of Charles Brooker, who is challenging Rand Paul for his Senate seat. And simply by looking at Rand Paul and his policies, it is clear that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey people. Well, except for Mitch McConnell, because he's just a fucking turtle. Vote. It's November 3rd. And Bulgarity for Charity has officially begun. And with a bang, no less. I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Cory Booker's New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, you'll get the chance to buy that roasting you've been jonesing for. We'll give you some highlights from the best skeptical conference in the business. And we'll learn that Jesus could have bought Twitter, too, if he'd wanted to. <laughs> First, the diatribe. You know, it's a really hard point to make. Psh, Einstein, what did he know? But that is precisely the point that I want to make with this diatribe. So bear with me for a second, because you see, Einstein once famously quipped that God doesn't play dice with the universe. And I think if he'd realized what a pain in the ass that quote would eventually become to rationalists, he probably would have worded it differently because this is thrown in our faces constantly by apologists who want to rhetorically recruit Einstein to their side of the argument against his will. And the argument goes something like this. Well, you know, Einstein once said God doesn't play dice with the universe. So clearly he believed in God. Are you saying you're smarter than Einstein? There's a lot wrong with this argument, obviously, not the least of which is the fact that as an atheist, I agree that God doesn't play dice with the universe. He doesn't play anything with anything. Right. I mean, fucking Aquaman doesn't play pinochle with space time either. I don't have to believe in Aquaman to endorse that statement. But of course, that skirts their point more than counters it. So a lot of people here will invoke Spinoza's God. Right, that is the you know God as conceived by 17th century Portuguese philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Now, to be honest, I, I would have an awfully hard time defining Spinoza's God in a way that doesn't take us way the fuck off subject. Uh, and the same is true of all the pithy definitions I could find online. So suffice to say, for our purposes here, the idea here is that the God that Einstein was referring to was more of a conceptual construct that stood in for the as yet unknown creative substance that makes the universe go. Right, less a deity, more a placeholder. And if the discussion is what Einstein believed, that's probably the right way to go. But the good news for us is that it doesn't fucking matter what Einstein believed. See, as is so often the case here, the key is in the context. Because the point that Einstein was making when he said that God didn't play dice with the universe was a demonstrably, unequivocally incorrect point. He invoked it as a justification for why he rejected the basic concepts of quantum mechanics, for fuck's sake. Those concepts are right. He was wrong. Like, right, we've now proven them to the point that very few serious scientists disagree with them, or at least disagree with the aspects that Einstein was actively rejecting when he said all this shit. Hell, if we could bring him forward in time and show him the present state of the evidence, Einstein would no doubt retract his previous statement and endorse the theory. And that's the key here. Einstein rejected something that was correct, and when he tried to justify it, he had to give the universe a weird intentionality and invoke God. In this instance, as is so often the case, God was invoked to justify an unfounded belief that was later proven wrong. And believe it or not, that isn't a dig against Einstein. Sure, Einstein was wrong in this instance. Einstein was probably wrong in a lot of instances. He was a genius all but unparalleled in written history, but he wasn't infallible. Reality doesn't do infallible. And we accept what we accept from Einstein, not because we're all so impressed with his intelligence, but because when you run the numbers, his math checks out. 
E does equal MC squared. That's just how science works. Hell, in a lot of ways, that's the whole fucking game when it comes to science. That's all science is. It's the willingness to hold out for proof no matter how authoritative or intelligent or revered the source of the claim is. Everything else is just how we define the terms in that sentence. So even if Einstein was like actually picturing a bearded dude in a white robe literally throwing dice against the wall, it wouldn't fucking matter to the argument of whether or not God existed. But of course, that's a hard one for religious people to get their heads around. Their whole thing comes from the idea that one person can be supremely authoritative, right? And it's also wound up in the idea that other people who speak on the behalf of that person need to be taken at face value even when the shit they say doesn't add up. It's based on the idea that some sources are sacred. And when that's the lens that you're looking at the world through, it makes perfect sense to think that we're stuck with theism if they can prove that Einstein said it. He's a scientist after all. He's one of the best scientists ever. So you have to believe whatever Einstein said unless you think you're a better scientist than he was. In other words, religious minds have been so poisoned by this idea of divine authority and revealed wisdom that they can't even conceive of what it's like to think for oneself. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Rolo and Maine to my Aquitaine, which are apparently the names of the three lions on England's coat of arms, Heath then right and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready for them to toss us some Christians? <laughs> okay. We're a really sad, inefficient Voltron in this scenario with like missing parts, but mm-hmm. I'm still 100% on board. Yeah, just like the UK, a sad, yeah. inefficient Voltron we're missing. <laughs> it all works out. But we always say. Never symbolize them better. And of course, before we get going today, I want to let everybody know about our annual fundraiser, Vulgarity for Charity. It's underway. We're once again raising money for modestneeds.org. It's a website that helps people on the verge of poverty that might not be eligible for other forms of financial aid. It's a great charity. We've been working with them for years. And in addition to all the warm fuzzies that you get from helping your fellow human being, you also get vulgarity. So here's how that works. You go to modestneeds.org. You make a donation of $50 or more. Then you send your receipt to us at vulgarityforcharity at gmail.com. That's the word for, not the number. Along with the receipt, tell us who you'd like us to insult. It could be a celebrity, a fictional character, a concept, or just your shitty brother-in-law. Also, be sure to send us a picture and details if the person you want us to roast isn't famous. We'll enter all the roast requests into a drawing, and we'll be insulting 200 of them on air. The 100 highest donors and another 100 chosen at random. But that random drawing will start before the fundraiser is over. So if you get your donation in early, you stand a better chance of being randomly drawn. Check the show notes for more details. And while you do that, we're going to pause for a word from this week's sponsor, Honey. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Which is why you are a stinky poop face. And sent. Dude. Oh, hey, Heath. What's up? What's this? What are you doing? There you are. What's the meaning of this text, Eli? Wait, he sent you one too? He sure did. He told me my old Nintendos were as stupid as my face. He told me I have the eyebrows of a Lithuanian. I'm not even sure what that means, but it did not feel complimentary. No. Sorry, guys, but I had to save money on Christmas presents somehow, and I figured what better way to do it than, you know, uh, thin the gift list a little. But Eli, if you want to save money on Christmas presents, why not just try honey? I tried, but the bees keep dying. Apparently, they need to go outside, too. No, silly goose on the loose. Honey. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. How does that work? Well, imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. It's true. I use Honey to save money on my Christmas shopping, but also in online stores you wouldn't expect, like Everyday Essentials and even food delivery apps. And Honey doesn't just work on your desktop. It works on your iPhone, too. Just activate it in Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey... You could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. I'd never recommend something I don't use. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. All right. Well, I guess I won't need to thin the Christmas list after all. Sorry, guys. So do you want to unsend this text I see you just sent Bryce? Oh, no, that one I send every year. Got it. Yeah. He's such a nice person. Just really a nice, nice guy. Oh, why don't you both marry him then? And now, back to the headlines. 
in our lead story tonight. Americans are bad at words. And, you know, thoughts are made of words. Mm -hmm. So yep. thinking, thinking is what I'm getting at. Americans are bad <laughs> at thinking. And the latest evidence for that comes in the form of a new survey from the Pew Research Center. They found that almost half our country believes we should live in a Christian nation, while at the same time believing that we should have a separation of church and state. Huh. We're bad at word thinking. So no, I, th I think it's less about Americans' aptitude with words and more about your stubborn insistence that they have specific and consistent meanings, Heath. Yeah. Living in a society. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, we'll stop pushing our religion through government when everyone is Christian is pretty much the Project Blitz handbook at this point, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. sure is. I think that might be on the cover. Yeah, so let's look at some of the numbers. When asked, do you think the U.S. should be a Christian nation? 45% of Americans said yes, and 51% said no. And apparently 4% don't understand how yes, no works in a question. Mm, mm -hmm. And the Christian bias was even worse on the question about the founders. When asked, do you think the founders intended for the U.S. to be a Christian nation? 60% said yes. What? And of course, <laughs> that's objectively false. Right. Even using the softest possible definition of Christian nation. Well, right, yeah, and it's, it's not like we have to interpret this shit through a fucking Ouija board a la constitutional originalist, right? The government <laughs> of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion isn't exactly ambiguous. That's pretty clear. I mean, sure, Noah, but what modern judge or politician said that? John Adams. Oh, the beer guy. No. Founder. And uh, speaking of the definition, it's worth noting the survey did not provide an exact definition of Christian nation before they asked the questions. But regardless of how you describe that phrase, way too many Americans seem to like those words, but then respond with conflicting answers on anything specific. Yeah. For example, 67% said churches should keep out of political matters. 77% said churches should not endorse political candidates. And 83% said Supreme Court justices should not bring their own religious views into their rulings. And look, hey, Pew Reports, I don't want to be a dick or anything. I know you guys are scientists or whatever. But if the result of your survey is hypocritical nonsense, do you mind, like, digging down a bit on your <laughs> questions? That'd be great. I mean, don't get me wrong, guys. It's good to know that 86% of Americans think black is white and up is down. But the why <laughs> here would be super useful yeah. for me as a consumer of your product. Yeah. In fairness, we are getting a pretty useful thing that we're just bad at thinking. I think that's a good thing to know. We should know that. Yeah, that's right. true. You didn't need yeah. to do a survey. I could have told you that. <laughs> just call me once a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can help you out. So obviously, if you hear the phrase Christian nation, you might want to think about Christian nationalism because of uh, words, because of those Again, words and what words, they mean. Yeah. And also maybe because of Neo-Nazis who try to violently overthrow American democracy by standing on the magical floor area of the U.S. House and doing a <laughs> spell in their head. But apparently that very vague connection between Christian nation and entirely different phrase Christian nationalism, that was hard to recognize for a lot of people. Or people were just ignorant. The survey found that more than half of Americans, 54%, knew nothing at all about the term Christian nationalism. What? Okay, so knowing my fellow Americans as I do, I think that's approximately true of all words and phrases. <laughs> okay, they get the entire McDonald's dollar menu, but then after that, the numbers yeah. drop <laughs> precipitously, guys. So here's the silver lining, I guess, if there is one. Among those who were at least somewhat familiar with the term Christian nationalism, the majority of that group had a view that was unfavorable. So oh, well, that's, that, good. That, that's good. And if you combine those people with educating the ones who knew absolutely nothing about that term, we should have a very clear majority who opposed the Republican Party at the very least and toss in, a, you know, a major improvement to the public education system, quick overhaul of the entire electoral system and, and a rule about mandatory voting. And we're looking good. Mm. And then at that point, we're looking good. We're almost there. <laughs> so... <laughs> Silver lining. Did I did I help? Yep. Couple steps away. Great. Fuck. And in much ado about nothing news tonight. 
Canada just released some new census data proving that they're even more better than us than they already were. That's right. According to Statistics Canada, which is a source citation, not a Yodesk sentence structure, nuns or people with no religious affiliation now make up more than a third of the country's population. Specifically, they're now 34.6% of the populace, up from just 16.5% as recently as 2001. And though Christians are still the majority, they're just barely clinging to it with only 53.3% of the population compared with 77.1% in 2011. Just practicing for everybody. For everybody. I don't know if yeah, they make yeah, us sing know, it, but so, like, yeah. I'm just getting ready. Yeah. Yep, yep. And this information comes out the exact same year as our first ever Canadian live show. Uh, you better believe I'm taking credit for this one as well. <laughs> right. You're welcome, Knuckleheads. Yeah. You're welcome. So, of course, these numbers vary quite a bit regionally. In Yukon and British Columbia, Christians are actually already a minority in the population. In British Columbia, that's no doubt a reflection of the same kind of West Coast liberalism that we get in the States. And in Yukon, there's like 14 fucking people. So it's a matter of you know, convincing Gordy and Sheila or whatever. And, but also, <laughs> if you divvy up Christianity at all, nuns outnumber them nationally. Right. So like the, the largest Christian denomination in the country is Catholic, which had the unfair advantage of being able to kill the competition's kids for a while. And, and they only <laughs> account for twenty nine point nine percent of the population or about two million fewer Canadians than the nuns. Right. And Canada has way more vague answers of yes about religion, too, than the United right, States, yeah. I would imagine. A bunch of those people are just like, yeah, fucking Christian, I guess. I don't know. Wait, can I say Leafs fan? <laughs> no? Okay, fine, fine. Christian, then. Yeah. I don't know. Fuck the Habs. Yeah, at this point, Canadians have harder lines drawn about which province makes the best poutine than they do religion. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> now, obviously, this is happening for a couple of different reasons. Immigration is changing the religious demographics quite a bit, and that's contributing to the drop in Christians, but not the rise in nuns, right? So immigrants are actually disproportionately religious. They're just way more likely to be Muslim, Hindu, or Sikh. Like nuns, their relative populations have more than doubled in the last 20 years as well. But those numbers are still super low at 5%, 2.5%, 2% respectively. The rise in nuns is being driven by the fact that Canadian kids are overwhelmingly being brought up without religion. And given that the Pope recently had to do a like countrywide tour to apologize for what happened the last time they gave Christians control over Canada's youth, I don't see that changing much in the near future. Yeah, but hey, Canada, keep this up, and this is how you get a Vancouver live show, or, you know, close to you. But yeah, I, 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 let's not tease them at this point. <laughs> and quick, while we work out our post-midterm escape plan, we're going to hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. <laughs> One of the things that makes our job difficult here at The Scathing Atheist is just how hard it is to exaggerate when it comes to how disgusting the political goals of the Christian right have become. I mean, honestly, if you listen back to archives, the hyperbolic examples we used seven or eight years ago are indistinguishable from the actual shit that they say today. And if you have any doubt about that at all, I present as Exhibit A, Christina Caramo, the Republican candidate for Secretary of State in Michigan. Now, she hasn't gotten much national press because there's no shortage of batshit theocrats on state ballots this year. And the secretary of state for America's 10th largest state just isn't high enough in the pecking order to matter much. But rest assured that she's one of the worst in terms of dangerous conspiracy theorists. She's endorsed the Trump's election lies. She claimed that the January 6th rioters were Antifa disguised as Trumpers. And according to court records, she once threatened to murder her family. And as if that wasn't plenty of a reason not to vote for her, we learned from Vice this week that she also claims Democratic elites drink blood and traffic in the body parts of aborted fetuses. So yeah, a couple years ago, she was apparently on a podcast called Red Pill News, where she endorsed some straight up next level conspiracy theories. Like it wasn't enough to say that Planned Parenthood sold body parts. She went all the way to sold body parts to Democratic lawmakers who consumed them to stay young. She's also made deleting her old transphobic and homophobic social media post into a full-time job ever since it started looking like she had a shot at winning elected office. But she's hardly the only person straining our collective powers of exaggeration right now. 
when Representative Eric Swalwell of California's 15th District put out an ad that depicted the nightmare world Republicans are after, where women get arrested for having abortions. Preacher Joe Jones of the Shield of Faith Baptist Church in Boise, Idaho, complained that it didn't go far enough. Sure, he wants women arrested and punished for exercising their reproductive rights, but he doesn't want to stop there. He also thinks, quote, abortion doctors should be put to death. The government should take them and slice them up. Not with a pizza, okay? Actually put them to death, end quote. So yeah, set aside how disturbing it is that his immediate association with people getting sliced to pieces is pizza, it's still a pretty fucked up thing to say. And for those of you who would accuse me of taking all of my examples from the extremes, I want to add one last story that comes to us from no fewer than 700 Southern Baptist pastors who are calling on the Southern Baptist Convention to officially ban women from serving as pastors in any SBC-affiliated churches. Now, to be clear, you could spend the rest of your life looking for a female pastor at an SBC church without ever finding one. This isn't a thing that's happening in the world. But since when has something had to exist for Christians to be afraid of it? So even amid all the negative press they're currently getting over the federal investigation into their sexual harassment responses, they're focused on getting he-man women haters written into their bylaws. So with yet another reminder of just how much job security I have, I'll wrap things up and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, we have a story about a Baptist leader being honest. And that's a rare thing. So I wanted to give the guy some credit and we're done. He's a rabid (laughs) anti-Semite. Oh. Texas hate preacher and riddle-bearing guardian of a bridge, Jonathan Shelley gave a sermon last week during which he told his congregation that hating Jewish people is a very important component of Christianity, that he doesn't like the term Judeo-Christian because, you know, the hyphen doesn't provide enough segregation for him. (laughs) He's mad they got to go first. Yeah, Yeah. they're right next to him. And that the Holocaust is probably fake, but it would have been a good thing if it had been real. It was, the whole goddamn spiel felt like there was some kind of anti-semitometer in the back that he's yeah. climbing. He's trying to max it out before his time ran out or something. Oh, oh, one attack, more. Yeah. I need one more. Yeah. Huh? If ever there was a track for Kanye to co-produce on. Am I right, everybody? Huh? <laughs> yeah. This could be their wear scum screen. <laughs> so the sermon or hate crime. We're going to say hate crime, but as usual, it's both. Yeah. The hate crime happened at the Steadfast Baptist Church in Texas. Not the one in the strip mall in the town of Hearst, just to be clear. They got evicted from that prime location. It's the new one in Wataga, Texas. And here's what Shelley had to say. Quote, we need to be warned of this serpent seed, the seed of the devil. He's talking about Jewish people. These Jews that are out there. He's just afraid of them in general. He continued by imitating the voice of a hypothetical critic, and he kind of talked to himself. He continued, haven't you heard about the Holocaust? Yeah. Why do I care? Adolf Hitler was an Antichrist figure. But you know what? If an Antichrist kills another Antichrist, I don't even cry one second. Critic voice again. Didn't he kill six million? I doubt it. Only if we were lucky. End exact quote. Okay, Heath, I don't like to give like performance notes on air, but I feel like you did your critic voice way less Jewish than he did his critic <laughs> voice. I toned it way down. Yes, I did. Yeah. No, the, the whole fucking steadfast church phenomenon is a byproduct of somebody betting that if a franchise has enough bigotry, it doesn't even need a chicken sandwich. Yep. Right. <laughs> and just in case that very nuanced point about the benefit of the alleged Holocaust <laughs> needed clarification. He also mentioned that a person carrying out a gun massacre at a gay bar would also be a good thing. Jesus. And from there, he lamented the prevalence of the phrase Judeo-Christian among all those bleeding heart liberal theocrats in the Republican Party. And OK, he's actually right about that. Wait, no, stay with me. Stay with me. I'm saying <laughs> he's right about the actual internal thoughts of Christian right politicians. They added the Judeo part as a cover, yes. for sure. Yep. It's basically just another version of, I have a Jewish friend. I seen a Jew once. Point being, Shelley is truly evil, but he's helping expose the truth by saying the quiet part out loud and therefore reminding us about the existence of that quiet part. And it's pretty prevalent, I would imagine. 
American Christians aren't saying Judeo-Christian at home with their family or at church with their church people or in their hearts. They're they're saying and thinking the opposite for sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, right. The ones that don't apologize to Jesus for the Judeo part are the ones that don't know it means Jewish. <laughs> yeah, it means exactly. what? I thought I just missed the part of the Bible that teaches you throw karate. Why didn't someone <laughs> tell me? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Bought this outfit for nothing. <laughs> so it definitely seemed like that was a hate speech at a tax exempt church that we subsidize at the federal and state levels. That being said, it's also very possible that Pastor Shelley was actually trying to win a lightning round of anti-Semitism in a game show that was happening. In which case, I do have follow up questions about the game show. <laughs> yeah, Jeopardy's gotten weird since they lost Alex. It's been hard to sort yeah. of. <laughs> yeah. But either way, this is what the quiet part sounds like when millions of Religious Americans think about other religions. The whole religion thing, it's got to go. But in the meantime, Pastor Shelley, I know you're listening. Big fan. If you're looking for some money, Adidas could use a new celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> you might eventually lose the contract, but not right away. Not for not a right while. Away. Not for you a, get a while. while. Yeah. Apply it, Skechers. <laughs> <laughs> and in Osei Can You Die news, we've got some good news out of the state of New York this week. A mere two years after the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, sued the Diocese of Buffalo, along with former bishops Richard J. Malone and Edward M. Gross, for raping a bunch of kids and then covering up those rapes, the state mm -hmm. and the diocese have reached a settlement that includes an unheard of agreement to secular oversight. Oh, laws. You're describing yeah. laws yeah. and law enforcement like we have for all the muggles already. That's good to hear. Thank I you. guess. Yeah, it's good news. Yeah. No, no. They agreed to laws. And the thing that makes that sentence remarkable isn't the fact that it was optional to that point. Yeah. <laughs> so going to the New York Times, quote, under the deal, priests who have been credibly accused of abuse will be assigned an independent monitor with law enforcement experience to ensure they comply with a list of restrictions, which include a ban on watching pornography, what? performing priestly duties, and having a post office box. And really quote from the New York Times. I was not expecting that to be the exact list <laughs> at all. Nope. Stop nope. fucking the kids. 100 years. You're uh, grounded for the weekend. No screen time either. <laughs> That's right. Really needed the restrictions to be, I don't know, uh, no leaving your jail cell except for eating and yard stuff because you're in jail now. There yeah. you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. And like, I'm no expert here, but I feel like not letting the celibate guys watch porn is doing more harm than good. No. Yeah. yeah. Like, so as Noah and Eth just pointed out, some of those restrictions are obviously idiotic. Like, I don't give a shit if priests have a P.O. box or watch porn. I very much do care if they're performing priestly duties. Also, not to shit on my own good news even more, but the article also mentions that those independent monitors are going to be overseen by Kathleen McChesney, a former high-ranking FBI official who also led the Child Protection Office at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which <laughs> is not a great point on your resume for me. Yikes. Yeah, right. Experience isn't always a good thing, but also, also, she'll be paid by the fucking diocese. Yeah. The, the, the person auditing the arrangement won't be a government employee or a law enforcement official, but rather a state approved employee of the diocese itself. Cool. It's a dependent investigation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. But un Anyways, it's fine. But all those objections aside, the introduction of secular law enforcement without magic secret laws to protect them is a vital step in both getting justice for victims and preventing future ones. And that thin a slice of the pie as it might be is to be celebrated. Yeah, no, like that, this actually will reduce the number of victims almost certainly as, yeah. as shitty as it is. So, And finally tonight in industrial strength camel lube news. <laughs> We have stories about not one but two self-anointed prophets and scathing atheist regulars taking time out of their sermons to remind everybody that Jesus was fucking loaded. Yes, in the kind of tandem tirades that must feel obligatory when yours is the nicest car in the parking lot and you're about to ask everybody else for money again, televangelist Robin <laughs> Bullock and YouTube evangelist Kat Kerr 
both paused their sermons last week to remind everybody that it is not a sin to be wealthy, damn it. And Jesus was probably talking about really big needles or microscopic <laughs> little camels. Yeah. Okay. So I was, I was reading about getting into heaven in the Bible. We're going to need a private jet camel and a really big needle that we're going to have to commission. <laughs> so we're going to send around the basket one more time. Yeah. Okay. So Y'all, he was talking about the space needle and the need for me and my friend, the camel, to dine in the spinning restaurant at its top. Read the Greek, motherfuckers. It's all very clear. <laughs> right. Ixos. Real, real close to that. So we're going to start with Robin Bullock, who looks like if wetness and disappointment had to share an avatar. <laughs> right? Doesn't he, though? And if you think the surname Bullock makes this sound like I'm just making shit up, I should add that his church is called Church International, and it's located in... Warrior, Alabama. Country land. America. <laughs> <Right? laughs> His son, Street Lane. Yeah. He explained Jesus' opulence thusly, quote, Now you can see it play out on the cross. When they took his raiment, he had three garments. Only the rich wore three. It got quiet. It always gets quiet because everybody thinks Jesus rode around on a donkey eating off the ground. He had five houses. I don't know if I believe that. I don't care. He had five houses. Why else do you think Joseph would get up in the middle of the night, hire a whole caravan and go to Egypt? He had the moolah to do it. End quote. Right. And you remember when Joseph and Mary showed up in Bethlehem? Joseph was like, hey, babe, yeah, you can give birth in the uh, pied terre that we have here, but <laughs> you know, we got to kick out people who Airbnb it. We lose the deposit. I was thinking barn covered in sheep dung instead. <laughs> make it easy. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That was in the Bible. He was literally wearing a crown, people of thorns, but a crown. <laughs> Let's pass that basket again, huh? Does that basket One more time. One more around? time around, guys. And it, so around the same time, about 500 miles southeast of Church International, show favorite and person who looks like if using a younger generation slang incorrectly was a person, Kat Kerr, was sharing <laughs> a similar message. But because it was Kat Kerr, her version included going to heaven and encountering something bizarrely impractical. Quote, Christ didn't actually live poor. He grew up in wealth with wealth. He had wealth his whole life. So these people who try to say it's wrong to be rich, you know, it's more holy to be poor. I don't think so. Do you know I saw some people's mansions in heaven? They were the size of New York City. One mansion. So he's not poor and he's certainly not broke. End quote. Cat care, I don't think any of us were expecting Jesus to like bum a cigarette when we got up there. It's, just, <laughs> it's a weird focus for you. It's a weird focus, Cat Care. <laughs> now, I have to thank Fred of the Show Hammond Meta for pointing out to me over on Only Sky that there is actually some legitimate debate about whether Jesus was poor or not. Like the the three garments thing apparently has some actual grounding and broke ass families back then probably didn't have their own donkeys and the motherfucker's first birthday present included two rare spices and a gold ingot, you know, that that kind of stuff. <laughs> but since he specifically listed selling your possessions as a prerequisite to following him and, and the only way to get a camel through the eye of a needle involves a black hole and some damn exquisite timing, I feel like their fanfic strains canon just a little. Yeah. Or, or maybe he was just rich and telling other rich people they couldn't get into heaven, right? Maybe the Book of the Shepherd has a bit about how public donkeys are full of demons. Have we checked on that? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, we don't know. We don't know. And on that quick reminder of just how little effort we'd have to put into our grift if we switch teams, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll talk about coming back. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm No Illusions, here to talk to you about Vulgarity for Charity. And I know what you're thinking. Whoa, 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 guys. You already told me everything I need to know about Vulgarity for Charity at the top of the headline segment. But we actually have a private message for you. You know, just between us. That's right. We know many of you want to help us break our fundraising goals, but don't have a particular roasty in mind. And to that, we say, please make Heath roast a dog. That's right. The first year of Vulgarity for Charity, we encouraged people to have Heath roast their dog because... Heath loves dogs so much, but as the years have gone on and Heath has been forced to roast truly hundreds of dogs, his psyche is near a breaking point. A breaking point that only you can help us reach. Furry face after furry face, wagging tail after wagging tail. 
Eventually, Heath will have been forced to examine so many dogs through the lens of hatred that he'll no longer be able to see them. They will blend and burn until there's nothing but dog in his mind's eye, until the places where Heath begins and dog ends start to blur. So if you're on the fence about who to have roasted or you'd just like to push Heath one step closer to madness, consider having him roast a dog this year. Hey, guys, what you doing? Oh, nothing. We were just recording outro stuff. Cool. Outro. Yep. Outro stuff. Got it. Got it. Uh, you guys hear the neighbor's new dog barking last night? It kept me up for hours. Oh, yeah. Totally. Totally, man. Huge pain. Right? I think I'm going to say something. You should. You should. You go ahead and say that. Our neighbors don't have a dog. No. No, they don't. What? Nothing, buddy. As you may already know, we spent last weekend at the world's best skeptical conference, QED, in Manchester, England. And while a bunch of you came out to see us, a bunch of you also didn't. So we're going to try to tempt you into making it to the next one with a quick recap in the form of our top 10 memories from QED 2022, starting with number 10. And I'm actually going to start at the end here because after the very last talk on the main stage wrapped up, which was incredible, by the way, the MC comes back on to do a quick wrap up and he asks, he's like, hey, by a show of hands, how many of you are at QED for the first time? And like more than a third of the hands in the audience went up. Right. Close to half. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. And, and look, I, I know the organizers were actually a little worried about the turnout because they hadn't done it in four years. COVID isn't over. A lot of people you know, still don't want to travel or be in big crowds. And the, and the British economy Relax. is on fire. Better. I bought a house for a nickel. That's well, it's better, better for us, but yeah, not for the locals. But like so many people that had never been there before showed up. And a ton of Americans showed up. A lot of Americans. I met people from at least 20 different states while I was there. So it was it was awesome to see so many new faces. That puts it pretty high on my top 10 list. Right. And those new faces are all coming back and they're bringing more friends next time. I was asking people about that all weekend and to a person, they said they'll definitely be coming to every future QED event they possibly can. Yeah. And they'll be rounding up more people along the way. And everyone loves... A good vaccine, so no problems with the uh, future of diseases. That should be fine. And now that Rishi Sunak is in place, there's no way anything goes wrong with the British economy ever again. That's well, all right. Yeah. I think we're all yeah. good. I think we're all good. Yeah, yeah. No, but seriously, like people kept asking us like, oh, are you guys going to be here next year too? And I kept having to explain that when they don't invite us, we just buy tickets, right? right. I'm, not, I'm not going without my QED fix. They have to ban me if they don't want me there. <laughs> Fuck yeah. And they might. Number nine. The fact that the atheist and skeptical movements have not merged with the far right. <laughs> Thank you. And anyone who ever suggested that with a blanket statement should reevaluate and retract that statement and publicly apologize for being wrong in a way that hurts the cause. Yeah. QED was a great example of how our movement is full of people with progressive ideals. I can't imagine there was one single person on the docket or in attendance whose politics aligned with any definition of far right or anything close to that. If that person was in fact there, they shut the fuck up and they're not coming back next time. Yeah, right. They were really uncomfortable. You wouldn't have found like as consistently liberal an audience at like the Democratic National Convention. Like for real. No, nope. there's no exaggeration. No, not even close. Yeah. And don't worry. I'm sure one of the authors of the whatever happened to the atheist movement trash takes we've seen this year is going to release their Oh, there they are. Counterpiece. Any day. <laughs> cool. yeah. yeah, right. right. Like uh -huh. a skeptic would. And in terms of diversity of perspectives, the speakers and panel members were very much not a bunch of cishet white guys. Honestly, I think our God awful movies show is the only thing that might fit that profile. And we do appreciate being the exception. But the conversations I had about politics certainly had a range of views, but the range started on the left. And that's the European left I'm talking about, to be clear. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nobody was just, you know, just asking questions about human rights or any bullshit like that. And if somebody did want to do that, be the asshole like that, I was clearly the guy to float that balloon with. <laughs> <laughs> right? I look like a leftist yeah. propaganda poster of the alt-right cishet white guy asshole. But no, nothing like that. The very clear prevailing attitude was one of empathy and justice and awareness. I'm not saying we don't have any work to do on this front, but 
this particular group as a whole was very encouraging for sure. Yeah, there's a great moment that I just remembered, which is one of the parents there was breastfeeding and they turned to someone who was an organizer at the conference and said, hey, do you think anyone would mind if I breastfed here? And the organizer said, yeah, everyone's going to be fine with you breastfeeding, breastfeed wherever you want. And the guy in front of them turned around and said, exactly right. You breastfeed wherever the fuck you want. Yeah. Ian. Ooh. And look, Whenever we point this out, someone always says like, oh, I know you guys are nice, but this one famous author I was a fan of 10 years ago still tweets this stuff. Yeah. And that's where everyone is getting their atheism. But like you have to grapple with the fact that QED is the largest skeptical conference in Europe and very often the world. Right. I I'm sorry it doesn't give you something to feel superior to, but that's where the movement is just by the fucking numbers. What you're right. talking about is atheist fandom. Yeah. And the fandom and the movement were always separate things to people doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hey, it's also true that some skeptical and atheist conferences did lean into the right wing bullshit. Right. But then they disappeared because of lack of attendance. The ones that are still going on, as far as I know, entirely are from that left wing progressive bent. Yeah. But you just wait till that Kickstarter comes through, man. You'll see. <laughs> You'll see. Number eight. All right. It might be a little weird to nominate myself and a thing I did <laughs> on our top 10 list, but why the hell not? Because you see, this year I decided to contribute to QED with more than just a live show and a panel. I decided to bring a physical gift. And with the permission of the hotel and the venue, I spent the last night of QED convincing people to try the worst rated botanical of all time. Chicago's own Malort. Revolting. Now, some of those reaction videos are on Twitter, but many more live in the hearts and minds of all of us. But truly, nothing united us all at the end of QED better than the universal cry of, quote, oh God, it's getting worse. How is it possible that it's getting worse? <laughs> End quote. That was Lucinda's exact reaction. I don't know if anyone captured the full spit take of me doing a shot right in front of Eli, but <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun moment. Number seven. So I'm going to go with a bit of a weird one here because it might have been the only thing that actually went wrong the entire weekend, at least from our perspective. It's Saturday night. The talks are over for the day. We're just getting ready for the Saturday night festivities. There's going to be a VIP dinner and then a comedy show that our very own Eli Bosnick hosted. And suddenly a fire alarm goes off. The entire hotel has to be evacuated until the fire department could show up and verify that there's no fire, which there, there wasn't. Yeah, it actually turns out that I just set off the smoke alarm with how hot I looked in my three-piece suit. Sorry about that, everyone. That was that was actually March. Lord rage might have done yeah, it. I'm so, not sure. <laughs> so, no, that was the next day. That was the alarm the next day. It might have done it in the past or the future. Oh, right, or yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's tachyons that are emitted from it or something. Yeah. So here we are, hundreds of strangers, mostly from the from the conference, and we're standing out in a drizzly, chilly British October evening, delaying our dinner and our entertainment. And it was a fucking blast. Yeah. Right. Like, like virtually everybody there seemed happy to have an hour to just chat and meet other conference goers without any other events going. It was like, it was so stunningly communal and congenial. Yeah. I enjoyed how the whole thing seemed natural to everyone. And I guess being a skeptic does feel like you're always standing in the rain during a fire drill. I guess it all makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, all we were missing for the metaphor to be complete would be like Marsh begging people not to rush back inside the burning building while they called him names and very much did <laughs> right, that. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, but just to give one great example, our favorite listener, April Poff, was there this year and, and she's got a cane. She's not as spry as she once was. Disagree. I saw her do a jump split on the dance floor. She but got we'll talk about it. It more impressive. and more spry as the nights went on. Anyway. Malort changes you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, so like some dude that she's never met Noticed her cane and brought her a chair. Where the fuck did this guy find a chair since we weren't allowed in the hotel? No goddamn clue. But he saw a fellow human being who was in need and made it happen. A fucking Anna set up like an impromptu daycare off to one corner of the sidewalk and kept the kids entertained the whole time. And, and when it was all over, when we got the all clear and everybody was allowed back inside the building, huge groups of people still lingered out there for 10, 15 minutes just finishing up the conversations they were having. Yeah. And I know we've said this a million times, but the thing that makes QED by far our favorite conference is the people. And literally everyone I talked to this weekend got to experience that and was as hooked as we are. Number six, the riff off. So 
Anyone who's a huge fan of Anna Kendrick, like myself, and therefore a huge fan of the movie Pitch Perfect, you'll know what this is for everybody else. Here's the part you need to know. That movie is about the enchanting world of college acapella singing. And Keith, there's a scene, what I'll, do we I'll say I'll about quick, describing the movie Pitch There's Perfect. a scene in that movie where all the acapella groups at this one college have a big party that includes a competition called a riff-off. It starts with a random prompt to get it started, like songs about sex. And the first group has to start singing something that fits. And then any other group can jump in on a particular lyric and start a new song from that word. And it keeps going until, well, in, in this case, until the movie scene is over and it's kind of natural. Mm -hmm. Well, that happened in real life at the QED bar on Saturday night. Please tell me this involves somebody walking in on you in the shower and not leaving until you agreed to sing with them. <laughs> it's, it's both. I'm not, there's two stories. I'm not doing oh, that oh, one. I'm doing, oh, my yep, bad. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. A different one. So I'm talking with Thomas Smith and a few other people. Oh, he's in both stories. Okay. Thomas right. is in both. That's correct. <laughs> Just, it, uh, don't, I'll tell you later. So no spoilers. I'm, I'm talking with Thomas Smith, a few other people, and something about a riff off came up. And that's when a delightful bartender from the South of England named Els dramatically burst into the conversation circle. She was like, riff off? She just slid along on her knees into the middle <laughs> of the circle. She's like, riff off? I challenge you, Thomas, to a riff off, which is a really bad idea most of the time, just socially, because most people are bad at singing and also bad at improv and real life doesn't have a script and you can't cut the scene. So you're going to get extremely awkward, cringy moments until it kind of just fizzles out into another extremely awkward, cringy moment at the very end. But with Thomas and Els, none of that applied. No! I gave them a prompt, and they went back and forth for like five minutes of actually good singing. They're both talented singers. Quickly improvised song switching, which was amazing without a script. And a finale where they went into a quick duet with proper harmony to close it out. It was 100% nice. insane. Crazy. Like, if a bunch of extras started dancing with perfect choreography, I would have been like, yeah, this all tracks. This all we're, at, we're at the nerdiest <laughs> prom party ever inside yeah. of a movie, and this is fantastic. <laughs> it was amazing. I literally thought it was like a prearranged flash mob right? thing. And I went up to Tom. I was like, what did they ask you? They were like, do us. And he was like, no, that just happened. And I was like, only at QED. <laughs> Number five. The Skeptical Parenting Panel. Again, I was part of this one, but they're going to release the video. And you'll see, I was pretty much just like a hype man. But to me, the Skeptical Parenting Panel was a great example of where the skeptic movement is and the stuff we need to be talking about, right? Three not cis white guys did most of the talking, as they should, and they talked about the effects of pseudoscience and bullshit on parenting as a woman and or genderqueer person. And not to steal blatantly from Heath's thing, but like, when I talk to normal people about skeptical conferences, there's often a response of like, oh, do you guys just sit around patting yourselves on the back? But right. that's really not what these talks were about, right? These are about giving a voice to folks who are often voiceless and then having very real and practical conversations about what people of privilege can do to help. And one of the groups most targeted by pseudoscience and bullshit and judgment is mom and non-male parents. So seeing them get to take the spotlight to talk about those issues was really awesome. And I was honored to chime in with the occasional dick joke. Yeah, the, that one, the sex panel and the one on neurodiversity, the, I, I thought were great examples of how practical the subject matter was for at a lot of the conference. Yeah, absolutely. Also, the Are We Winning that Noah was on this. It was, and Noah was, it was on was so good. A great panel. And it was all about, OK, practical solutions. What's worked in the past? What hasn't? Right. Yeah. What should we anticipate as a problem in the future? How do we make that work? It was just all geared toward real things. It was a fantastic, fantastic feel throughout the conference. And speaking of things that I was on. Number four. I have uh, <laughs> the shit that I took after Incredulous. <laughs> Look, I, okay, okay. I, I know nobody wants to know about my bowel movements, but I, I have to mention this, okay? Okay, I ask for information about that all the time. Now, all of a sudden, it's for the <laughs> listeners. You're chatting it up, chatty Kathy over there. <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. No, go ahead, go ahead. Hey, I no longer feel bad about using Malort as one of my things. So, okay. yeah, so I, I, I didn't make anybody drink it at the end of this story or anything, Eli. So I don't <laughs> feel like you should. I, I guess you shouldn't feel like including, you should feel bad about doing it. So anyway. 
First day of the conference. I'm jet lagged as all fuck. Lucinda and I get up at 630 in the fucking morning, which we never do. And we have breakfast. And then by 11 a.m., Eli messages and asks if we want to go to breakfast. And Eli's defense like that is way more in keeping with when we as a group usually have breakfast. Right. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll just have another breakfast. I'll call that my lunch. But what that means is that, like, as far as my internal clock, which hasn't adjusted to England yet, is concerned, I just ate a large meal at 1 30 a.m. and then another at 6 a.m. Anyway, about an hour after that, I check in for a live record of Andy Wilson's podcast, Incredulous. Yeah. What we're saying is that Noah's shit was on the same release schedule as Incredulous at that point. <laughs> you know, nobody was expecting one to come out, but it had been way too long <laughs> yes. since one had. Right. No, exactly. Yeah. Very no, similar. It takes one shit per four prime ministers of the UK. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. Accompanied by a saxophone. Oh, yeah. Well, well that's true. <laughs> So, okay, so I'm about 20 minutes into this 50 minute record when this, you know, the klaxon goes off in my stomach and it gives me the you're going to shit in four minutes, whether you like it or not warning. But we're right in the middle of a record and it's fucking live, right? There's no way that I can just be like, Andy, cover me. I need to step off for 10 minutes without making it damn (laughs) awkward. And I needed to step off for a lot more than 10 minutes. Okay, but there's an amazing version of this where Noah presents his entire segment over Skype from the bathroom during a very aggressive shit just doing the whole Oh, thing. that would have been good. Or shits his pants at Incredulous going down in QED history yeah. as the legend he is. It's a much better story for the for the listeners if I did. <laughs> so, okay, but I, did, I didn't though. I made it. I got through the next 30 minutes. Jonathan Jerry was on one side of me. Marsh was on the other. I do not envy the olfactory experience that they went through sitting next to me for 30 minutes as I came carefully cracked open the relief valve here and there. But but the instant Andy wraps up the show, I'm in full sprint to the bathroom. People are like, hey, can I get a selfie with you? And I'm like, I'm going to be blurry in it. You're going to need to time it great. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was that was miserable. But damn, did actually taking that much awaited shit feel good when I got there? Yeah. And if you were in the bathroom after Incredulous and you saw that one of the toilets had been cracked down the middle by what appeared <laughs> yes. to be a Hattoro Hansai sword, now you know why. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Number three, the billionaire money conversation. Again, it all starts with the best part of the conference, which is just hanging out with everyone, talking in between the scheduled events. Those events, to be clear, were amazing, as usual. But the general camaraderie, it's my favorite part. So it's a few minutes before a panel, and I'm talking with some people about what we might do if we won a billion dollars in the lottery. Oh, and oh, an- another. Yeah, Eli, what's that? Did you have a question? I have my idea. I, I'm going to have to beep it out anyway. So no. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Okay. So another one of my favorite people at the conference, Ian from the North, he named a few good answers about philanthropy. And then he added, yeah, my dad was a giant bigot. I'd also pay Eli to fuck my dead dad. Oh, and then there's, there's a pause in the conversation and I watch about 20 people all silently picturing Eli fucking the corpse of their shitty father and just like looking up in the air and thinking about it and checking out angles, everyone in complete silence for a while. And then else, she's in another story, else from the riff off, she says, hey, Ian, can you lend me the money so Eli can fuck my dead dad too? He's cremated, but I think that's that's better in certain ways if you think about it. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, what we're saying is keep those Patreon donations coming because Eli's backup plans are really fucked up. <laughs> yeah, fucked up, <laughs> fucked down, yeah, so sideways. We're chuckling about this as we all head upstairs, line up for the panel. And immediately, as if summoned by a, well, very disturbing bat signal, Eli walks up and everyone starts weeping with laughter right away. And I'm like, hey, Eli, Ian and else have a quick question for you. They finally get the question out and Eli proceeds to do a very long pantomime of exactly how this is going to happen. It was it was beautiful. We're all <laughs> we're all laughing. The rest of the line had no idea what was happening. Great warm up for the well, the very serious panel about how to combat disinformation in our epistemically challenged world. It's a serious conference. <laughs> it's very serious. Exactly. Number two, skeptic camp. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Skepticamp is something QED has been doing for the last four years or so. Well, they haven't done a conference in the last four years, so probably. Oh, yeah, sorry. The last four QEDs 
or so. But it takes place right at the start of QED, and it's a chance for people to give shorter sort of 10 to 15 minute talks on the topic of their choice. And while all the speakers were incredible and would make up like a main stage lineup at most conferences, it served as this amazing tasting of like different ideas and viewpoints. So friend of the show, Aaron Rabbi, gave a talk about anti-Semitic memes working their way into mainstream discourse. Heath in a mustache talked about incest. It was mm -hmm. really, really good. It was a great, great talk. Well, if for no other reason than just that we got to watch science communicators get flustered as their time was running out and re they realized that they had to like speed explain the actual chemistry of ketosis and shit. <laughs> it was, it was fun. And I wanted to mention this one because to me, it actually symbolizes the second best thing about QED, which is the incredible diversity of viewpoints that it's dedicated to, right? A lot of skeptic conferences, for better or worse, are centered around which one of the famous science communicator guys can we bring out on the last day and like how many people will not ruffle any feathers in between those two guys. But Skeptic Camp represented what QED is really all about. It's about the conversations that need to be had about skepticism, whether or not someone has like a huge platform or an audience and whether or not someone's going to sell the organizers tickets. And I just thought that was genuinely amazing. Good answer. Absolutely. Ooh, before we get to number one, Quick honorable mention for yes, Drunk Marsh on Sunday night. Drunk Always Marsh on Sunday yes. night. Drunk Marsh losing at pool. Drunk Marsh winning at pool. Drunk Marsh <laughs> with his shirt off trying to fight a bouncer because, quote, <laughs> you look a bit Irish. <laughs> I mean, one of those things is made up. But yes, Drunk yeah, Marsh he on didn't, Sunday. He didn't win any pool. <laughs> drunk, no, Drunk Marsh did. He drunk. Yeah, no. Drunk and I imagine Sober Marsh. Very good at pool. Very, very I was, good I was at very pool. impressed. Yeah. He, he was talking about like his family. He's got family full of hustlers. Like his dad, you, you know, used to play a little bit. And then his grandpa was like really good. And then his grandma apparently is the real hustler of the family. She would set up a table at like holidays and take everybody's money. Fuck yeah. Nice. So granny. And finally at number one. Of course, as always, I'm going to go with the same thing that we always put at number one. And it's not because it's tradition. It's because it's true. The best part of these events is always the chance to meet you, to meet our listeners and 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 make this a two way conversation for a very short while to watch our, the like the community that we've built up online, take shape and meet space to get hugs, to hear how the show has impacted people's lives, to hear stories about how they came to be atheists and atheist activists and what struggles they faced along the way to get all the diatribe ideas that come from that shit. Even after a decade of doing this, I am still overwhelmed every time I'm reminded of exactly what sits on the other side of this microphone. Yeah, I guess so many people started conversations with like, I don't want to bother you. And it was really nice to be like, no, you are not bothering me. This is right. what we are here for. Yep. Come have a beer and try not to get hit by Drunk Marsh, who now has nunchucks. For and he's reason. got nunchucks. <laughs> yeah. He has nunchucks. So yeah, another amazing conference from the Merseyside Skeptics. Great talks, great panels, great community. I'm not sure when the next one will be, but if you already regret missing this one, stay tuned for more information. And if you don't regret missing this one, you should really get on that or Drunk Marsh will find you. <laughs> Before we close the loop this week, I want to remind you one more time that Vulgarity for Charity is underway. We're recording this on day two, and already the total is in the five-figure range, and that first figure isn't a one. We should be able to take Vulgarity for Charity's lifetime total of donations over the million dollar mark this year, but we can't do it without your help. Again, check the show notes for more information. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Ride, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday, and even new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this show wouldn't count if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for brightening England's days, Eli Bosnick for darkening their nights, and Lucinda Illusions for being the best damn traveling companion you could ever want. I also want to thank everybody who's donated to Vulgarity for Charity already and to everybody who's gonna. I also want to thank Revan for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Uh, looks like it got to yours just in the nick of time. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most savory sapiens, Jason, Brian, Aaron, Dan, Sloan, Vader, Geek of Doom, Krista, the younglings had it coming, Keith, Jacob, and Jesse. Jason, Brian, Aaron, and Dan, who are so virile, Viagra takes them. Sloan, Vader, Geek, and Krista, who are so badass if they had a heart attack, it'd probably be attacking somebody else. And genocide apologist Keith, Jacob, and Jesse, who are so hot, Fahrenheit gives up before it gets to them. Together, this dozen dastardly disbelievers delivered a dollar by dollars to draw out our diatribes of the dangers of deities this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you own early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donation 
donate button on the right side of the homepage at scalingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but money's too expensive to spend on free stuff, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. Unless, of course, you left Twitter on principle, which I would not remotely blame you for. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We're also the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, and death threats, you can find all the contact info on the contact page at scalingatheist.com. So like, yeah, I was gonna thank you though. <laughs> so, so, so after like, you, no, no, after <laughs> you <laughs> podcast, you know, I'll count you down. Yeah, 50, no, if you would, it's 49. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC, copyright 2022, all rights reserved.